All right, troops, strong and conditioned, live and direct from Glasgow, Scotland. And tonight, I have the deep honour of having on the man, the myth, the legend, natural hypertrophy. NH, how are you today, brother? I am quite excellent. Very happy to be here. And I'm very happy for you to be here because you're a hard man to get a hold of. I tend to find you's noble natties are very difficult to make contact with uh, on online, so to speak. Yeah, a very busy crowd of people always doing something or the other. Yeah, th we've been trying to get on this for like six months, so I'm glad it's <laughs> happening. <laughs> it's obviously all that programming that you're doing. It consumes a lot of your time. Mm -hmm. So, so NH, I like to start the podcast asking people to explain the origins of their training journey. So could you please give us a, a, a brief rundown where it started and how it evolved into the man you have became today? Of course. So um, I was always very cerebral because that was the way I was raised. I was always told that education was the most important thing. I was encouraged to read, but my parents didn't really care if I just stayed home all day. I was never actually encouraged to be active or to even go outside. And so going into my early teens, I was very cerebral, but I was also extremely scrawny and weak. And it's something that started to become a problem because while well, bullying is a thing, we don't live in a perfect world. And so I, at some point, had to start learning how to defend myself and to defend yourself for good ways to just get bigger so that people don't mess with you. And eventually I realized that because I didn't want to keep fighting for the rest of my life, I was tired of being jumped on a daily basis. I decided to just go down the bodybuilding route. Some people would prefer to just do martial arts and just kick ass all day. It's not my thing. So my, my, my thought process was, okay, if I get big enough, these guys will leave me alone. And so I just started bodybuilding at the age of 15 and there we are 15 years later. So did the bullying stop once you gained a bit of mass? Well, the bullying stopped because I became a psychopath and I would <laughs> fight back 10 times harder than anyone could expect from very small things. So like if you slapped a book out of my hands, I would beat you up, it, which was completely out of proportion, but it was my only defense mechanism back then. And then I got bigger and I realized that, yeah, at some point when you are like 20, 30 pounds over the average person, which in France is not that hard because French men are very small, at least in Paris, people are not going to go after you. They go after easy prey. Yeah, I, I, I know a few people who have been bullied uh, like when I went to school when you always had that one guy who snapped and they just had that hair trigger moment where they would just launch themselves into attacks and it, it just became quite a, a, a quite a sad thing to see actually yeah uh, yeah but because... at the same time we know that bullies don't like being uh, attacked back that's usually the best form of defense is attack in that respect so mm -hmm. obviously that's something that stood you in good stead so it's it's interesting that you mentioned that you had a, a cerebral attitude and that's definitely something that you bring to the table with regards to programming and bodybuilding. At what point did you decide that the conventional thinking wasn't applicable to yourself and you started to create your own style of programming? Well, actually, I started programming the day I started training because regardless of what you do, your programming, right? It's something that I tell people. If you go into the gym and you do things randomly and you pick exercises randomly, that is still programming. It's just you're not paying attention. So you're doing math with a blindfold on. Might as well actually do things properly, right? So when I got started training, I actually would create splits. There were terrible splits, but there were still splits. But then I discovered YouTube Fitness and other people started to do the thinking for me. And I trusted them, of course, they were bigger than me, stronger than me. So I thought, well, they, they must know better, right? But quickly I found out that this wasn't the case because these people tended to follow dogmas that did not align with my goals. And these were usually people who trained for strength, which is why it's not really their fault. It was my fault for not understanding that their goal wasn't my goal. And this is when I started to program for myself. And I realized the more I became advanced in terms of bodybuilding programming that it's two completely different paths. And sometimes they intertwine because strength and size are connected to a degree. But we needed a complete revamping of bodybuilding because too many people were not using the proper, proper methods. And this is when I realized, hey, 
I have a home gym, I have a phone, why not just start a YouTube channel so I can actually share with people? Yeah. So what was your cue to decide to start sharing your knowledge and your training experience? Well, it was for me one environment because for a very long time I was in a university gym and they just simply did not allow recording. I also lived in a very small house with a lot of people as a broke college roommate. So there was no space for me to even record. So there was no option, I guess. And then also in 2020, when I started my channel, uh, something happened. I'm not going to go too much into that, but a person close to me died. And this is when I realized that if I waited for things to finally be perfect, to start doing what I wanted and what I loved, it would actually never happen because that's not how life works. You don't have an angel that comes down the sky and tells you, hey, this is the moment. You pick yeah. that moment and you make it happen. So I said, hey, you know what? It's going to be terrible videos with no editing and a bad sound phone, but I don't care. I need to start now. Yeah. So so what, what inspired you to take that very low tech approach? I, particularly in a world where it's highly aesthetic and the editing is just it's, it's, it's a bit of a mind fuck at times. I've always loved old school YouTube fitness. I've always loved the guy in front of a camera who talks with no cuts, no editing, it's just raw information. And I think that we've lost so much because we've moved away from that format. Now everything needs to be snappy. If a format is longer than 15 minutes, people lose their mind because it's too long, it could be shorter. But the issue is that training your attention span and focus is just as essential in bodybuilding and in reality anything in life than training your muscles because if you can't focus for 15 minutes what are the chances you're going to be focusing for 10 years on your program and training it's zero percent so this is what i want to give back to my viewers as well i want to give them back the ability to just sit down and focus for a long time so uh, to be able to pull that off you have to have a certain magnetism to your personality because not anyone can sit and speak to a camera for 40 to 45 minutes and captivate people's attention how have you developed that skill set for me it's training right some people are good at it immediately some people are, are very great public speakers they have that aura and that charisma i didn't have that if you go back to my first videos i mean even 15 minutes seemed so long to me because I didn't have the stamina to speak for that long. I couldn't like get my thoughts to flow properly in order. And also, I was not comfortable on camera, you could tell. But I just never stopped. I kept making videos. And now I'm at a point where I can make a two-hour long video. My voice won't be tired. My brain won't be tired. And people will sit through it and think and write in the comment like, how was this two hours? It felt like 20 minutes. It's also because I'm now much more focused on the structure of the video. What I've realized is that a 30 minute long video that is poorly structured is going to feel longer than one that is 55 minutes with a perfect flowing structure where everything goes into the other. But there's also a problem with this approach, which is that it's less natural because you might end up reading a script and at this point why not just post the text why make a video so you have to have the two you have to have the structure and the ability to make it sound natural as you go through it yeah so so how do you create the structure what's your process my formal uh my degree and my formal training at school at least was in literature and something that we do a ton in france at least is we create what we call a dissertation or a commentary and yeah. to do that the first step is you create a structure you create a template so it's like big one let's say i don't know like existentialism little a the quest for meaning little b does truth exist you know you create a skeleton and then you fill it up with information that's yeah, also yeah. how i approach my structure every time i write a new script it's like i'm doing homework yeah and is this something you did from the onset nope at the, at the start i had like an idea like let's say junk volume and i would just ramble about junk volume but then it would it would frustrate me because i would repeat myself and also i would realize once the video was posted hey you forgot this you forgot that you forgot this why not just script your videos that way you can avoid that yeah so do you like i assume you do not script your videos but you've always got an infamous piece of paper at hand i always notice that you're kind of waving a bit of piece of paper off camera does that contain bullet points and you just kind of add in the the meat filling so to speak 
Yes, always bullet points, because I found that if I write four sentences, I just end up reading them, which is no good. So yeah. it's still part memory, but I have like the broad, the broad spectrum of what I need to cover for that bullet points. Yeah. Do you feel that your YouTube channel was born out of an anger towards YouTube fitness? Yeah, I think it's it's a good way to put it because <laughs> I was mad at people and myself for wasting so much time because I've realized, wow, I could have spent my time much more productively if I didn't follow these outdated methods that just had me in a loop or even doing things that were destructive because I hurt my body times and times again. I had certain injuries that could have been requiring surgery or could have been very severe and could have left me lame for the rest of my life. And thankfully, it wasn't the case. But I realized that it was because I was following bad advice. And then it was also an outlet. Um, some of your viewers, and maybe you might re relate to that, but I'm the type of person that speaks to himself, right? When I'm by myself or with my cats or dogs, I speak to them as if they were humans because I have so many thoughts that I feel like if I don't let them come out, I'm going to go insane. And so my YouTube yeah. channel is that. Sometimes I wake up and I think, hmm, I want to talk about that topic. I write a script, I make a video, and that's it. I can speak yeah. to people. Yeah. It takes a certain degree of balls in some respects because you put yourself out there. Most people do not want to offend on YouTube fitness, but you sometimes come across like you go out of your way to offend is, is that your personality as a whole or is that something that you've had to bulk up so to speak to kind of just reinforce that natural hypertrophy character to a certain degree i've always been a prick <laughs> but when i was younger i didn't have the muscle mass to back back up all of that that prickishness but now that i have it i can just let it fly this is not a character this is who i am in real life meaning that i'm very abrasive I do not hold back. And if I think something needs to be said, I will say it. Now, I don't go out of my way to be offensive because I think that this is a slippery slope into just becoming an asshole. But if I think you need to hear something, even if it's going to hurt your feelings, I'm going to say it because, I mean, at the end of the day, it's best to be hurt for like two hours and be mad at me and then maybe change your ways later than to not be hurt and be comfortable. But be stuck in your bad ways forever so uh, to me i personally perceive it like this if i offend you i'm i'm helping you right it's a favor that i'm doing you because no one else in in your life is going to be willing to do that people are too afraid to anger people too afraid of being rejected or cancelled I, I do not care I, if i think it's true i will say it yeah I, I i always pick up in that very french characteristic of being quite scathing I mean, when I message Hasoviatch at times, he can kind of take my breath away by how scathing his messages can be. And I think I messaged yourself and you, you just cut me off with a, I already told you I would come on a certain date. Where, whereas in Scotland, that, like, you would never say that to anyone. No, but, yeah, the, the, the French are, the French are. <laughs> this is why when people visit friends, they say, oh, French people are, are mean. Gratuously. Yeah. Well, not mean. It's just we don't have time to take your feelings into account. We we just say, I mean, and that's the thing too, is that we don't go out of our way to be like this. We are like this to each other. And this is, yeah. for me, if, when I move to a, a more Protestant-based, more Anglo-based country, my attitude was perceived as aggressiveness a lot of the time. And people were like, in social gatherings, like putting me aside and saying, hey, you're going to start a fight. You need to like calm down you need to chill because you're being mean to these people out there and i was like mean that's how we speak to each other in france it's not being mean so have you had to temper your personality to a certain degree since you've moved overseas for the people that i love and that i care about yes i will i will tone it down just a tiny bit i will be a little bit nicer i'll put some sugar in the coffee but if i don't know you no <laughs> So the one question I've always wanted to ask you is that you always focus on the parasocial element of YouTube fitness and how you it's something that you don't agree with. You think it's a toxic trait. That's what I've picked up anyway. Correct me if I'm wrong. However, how do you prevent that with the fact that you've got quite a magnetic personality yourself and you also touch on philosophical subjects, which in by the very nature, can create a parasocial no nature with the viewer who will start to absorb and start to hang off your every word. 
Yeah, that that is the part of the paradox of powerful relationships. He who warns people about them creates a powerful relationship with the people he wants because in their eyes you become a savior or you become someone that knows the truth so naturally they start to take your words for what they are which they are going to perceive as unquestionable and true which they're not and then you're stuck in my situation where i've been warning people about the parasocial but it does not stop the fact that there is parasocial going on on my channel and I have people that I know for a fact are fanboys and they look at me as if I was some sort of guru or god. Now, I could scream at these people and shake them all day long and I believe that this would have absolutely no impact. The best I can do is tell people, hey, never worship anyone. I'm just a guy. I'm just like you. I'm just a bro that is giving you advice. If some people want to disregard that and put me on a pedestal, there's nothing I can do about it. If you see here, here behind me, there's a poster. I can it's, a, see that. Yeah. it's a Dune poster, right, right. and Dune is a st is a story about past relationships. Um, just like quickly, I'm sure that people who have read Dune are are geeking out in the the future comments when the video will be posted. But essentially, there is a character in Dune named Paul who creates a religion because he's very magnetic and charismatic. Then he realizes how dangerous the religion he created is because it creates uh, it creates terrorism and mass death. And he tries to take it back and he realizes that he cannot, that it's now out of his hands, that the creation is now bigger than the creator. Well, that's the exact same thing I'm feeling now. I, I, I'm not in control of this. I cannot help people if they're being stuck in the black hole. Yeah, I think it's unavoidable because fitness in particular is the essence of self-improvement because it's very it's it, it's it's tangible it's it's not a mental concept you actually see things taking place it's not like you can think to yourself i'm becoming mentally stronger you will never know if you're becoming mentally stronger until you're in a certain situation but when you're seeing your muscles grow you're actually seeing the improvement take place and when that manifests itself and young men in particular then they are going to gravitate towards you and start to look at you as a a major influence in their life which leads me on to my next question. Who were your big influences when it came to training? So when I first started, the people who I would call my uh, fitness mamas would be <laughs> Omar Izov, Candido Training, and Alan Thro. That was my big three. 90% of the content I consumed were them. And I can thank them because they saved me from pro bodybuilding. Uh, before that, just like anyone else, I was following all of these big bodybuilders on drugs who gave horrible advice, but it was the only thing available for people who wanted to look better. And then the powerlifting wave started and these guys I decided arrived on the scene and I realized, wow, these people are relatable. They have an ego that's in check. And on top of that, they give very simple advice that works. So just like many young men, I flocked to them and they gave me a very solid base to work off for the future. Yeah. So was it intentional on your part to just focus on three influencers to a certain degree? Because I feel that there's so many out there and you can get sucked down so many rabbit holes that your head starts to go all over the place and it's hard to funnel your efforts because one guy says something another guy says something and so on now well, back then it wasn't that hard to like narrow it down because there was very few people in 2010 youtube fitness was was a, was a, the ghost of what it is today there were a few guys and so it was easy to sort of pick because you didn't have a choice today i feel bad for people who are discovering youtube fitness because it's like times and times again i'm on youtube and i find i discover a new fitness channel from a guy who has millions of subscribers and I've never heard of him. Well, back then, if you had 50K subs, that was the end of the wood. Now it's like nothing. So yeah. you're right. People are going to discover an influencer. And usually what they do is they latch onto the first guy they find, which is terrifying because this means that the algorithm literally dictates their life. Whatever the algorithm shows them will be their future. It will be their fitness journey. And when you see the type of people who are being recommended by the algorithm, en masse to young lifters it's horrible because it's a bunch of teenagers on drugs yeah absolutely absolutely and it's it's so prevalent where whereas when i was growing up like in order to access steroids you had to like speak to a gangster who was in the gym and you had to develop a relationship 
and then maybe a year or two down the line, he may point you in a certain direction. Whereas now you can just go onto a forum and next thing you know, you've got a big bottle of trend being delivered through your door within two or three days. But it's hard for these guys to avoid that trap when the aesthetic that is now being presented as normal is unobtainable otherwise. Yeah, you, you sort of have to also accept that this is part of the course while always realizing that it doesn't have to be that way. Because back then, as you said, stories were hush-hush, and some people like to think that now it's better because at least it's in the open. But the fact that it's in the open makes it much more accessible to people. I remember back then, it was underground, and yeah, you would never be able to score anything unless you actually met a guy. It was all black market stuff. Now, I mean, it's so easy to find stuff online, even Psalms that are technically legal that teenagers can access, and they, it gets delivered to their doors. And the problem is that apparently the parents don't pay attention. I know that for me, if I used my mom's credit card for anything, even like buying Skittles, I would get a knock on my bedroom door like 290 for Skittles. What is this? But <laughs> apparently now parents just give their credit card away and they see like minus $99 for like axidosomol, like some like chemical name, and they don't question it. I personally don't understand why they're not doing their job, but it is therefore the responsibility of the national community on the platform to push back and point that out and say, hey, that's not normal. Being yeah. 17 on so much drug that you look 45 with a bad heart is not normal. Yeah. Was there ever a point at the early stages of your lifting history where you thought, Mm, it was quite a tempting idea. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I remember it because it was also the time in my lifting journey where I was the dumbest, I was the most miserable, and I was seeing the least results, right? This is the type of people that jump on drugs. This myth that it's natural lifters who have been pushing the limit for 10 years and then finally they don't have a choice, they have to take drugs. That's a myth. That's not true. People who jump on PEDs are people who are impatient and who are not seeing results using the proper methods. So they use the easier, easy way out, which is steroids. And back then, I was tempted to jump on it by the new wave of open bodybuilders who are honest about their use, but in reality, what they were, what they were doing is they were promoting PEDs because they would make videos for information or even prevention. There are a bunch of liars and they would just pimp PEDs and say, I take this and it makes me, my arms get this big and I get all of these good effects. And then at the end of the video, they say, oh, also it can kill you. Bye. <laughs> Teenagers are only going to retain the positive that you share. That is not prevention. You're literally promoting PEDs. I'm always fascinated by the coping strategy of roiders when they talk about blood work. I've got my blood work done. I'm, my bloods are perfect. And it's like, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. It just seems like one big massive coping strategy when they know deep down in their soul they are causing themselves untold harm. Yeah, I mean, and even if you try to tell them that, because the funny thing too is that their blood work is not perfect. It usually isn't at all. They tend to have way too high of a cholesterol. They, they have way too many uh, red blood cells. But they go to a doctor that usually is also in cahoot with the 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 um, the prescribing of PEDs. That guy yeah. is not going to tell you you're dying. You're making him so much money. Yeah, he's going to tell you, oh, you're fine. All good. Yeah. The, a slight yeah. issue with blood pressure. That's... Yeah. It's so, so, so what was the, the, the moment you decided that you were not going to pursue that route? So... I was extremely lucky because I eventually met people in my gym back then who were on PEDs. And you couldn't miss these people because they were very loud, the biggest at the gym, but also they never really trained. I mean that I never saw these people train. They would do like a few cable pushdowns, a few like one rep max on bench, but they never put in the work. And so eventually I was approached by these guys because I was pretty big myself and we started to build a relationship. And I didn't like them very much because they were a bunch of assholes. But the more I spent time with them, the more I realized that these people were actually very sad, right? All of this yeah. like tough guy persona was a facade. They were trying yeah. to make up for something. And eventually I got very close to one of them who opened up and told me, hey, like I'm addicted. I cannot yeah. not have that. He has he had tried to get off of all of the juice, but he would get super depressed, he would get down, and so he would always jump back on, but he told me that it didn't make him happy. He was forced 
to continue his drug use. And I was at this college in this uni gym for four years. Within four years, two of the guys died. And that was a group of eight people, men in their 30s. Two of them yeah. died. And how did they die? One of them was heart attack. So he just dropped dead in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And the other one was complications with, rin uh, with kidney failure. So from what I understand, he had to get a form of dialysis every single week because his kidneys simply did not work anymore. And at yeah. some point, he got an infection and the infection just sky uh, um, snowballed out of control and he died. And, and these were guys in their 30s? 30s. That's, that's really fucking scary, man. That's it's scary one and two no one knew these guys so they'll yeah. they'll dev didn't make any ripples one day they were there and the other day they weren't and when you look at social media that's sort of the same thing people convince themselves that pds can't be that dangerous because well look at this pd user he's been there for five years yeah but you don't look at the hundreds that disappear and no one has questions no one yeah. knows where they went i'll tell you where yeah. they went to their tomb they're dead yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's also that these guys are probably being guided like med by medical professionals, whereas most guys in the gym are like getting their information from a faceless entity online who's telling them take this, take that, take this, and they have no one to go to, and they're just getting really like crazy information from guy. Like, it could be anybody. It could be a guy playing World of Warcraft or anything, and they're just putting their life on the line just to achieve a certain aesthetic. Yeah, and I remember like talking about a faceless person that gives you information. I remember bodybuilding forums back then, like bodybuilding.com, where teenagers would go on and say, hey, I want to do my first cycle, what should I use? And you'd have a random guy that would give you like a gram of test or a gram of that, which is so much. It's already bad enough if it was, it was half of that, but it's so much that you then there's no wonder why there's complications down the line. Because even with moderate use, PDs are dangerous, but with like completely unlimited use with no eye on the consequences, it's essentially just playing Russian roulette. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, I want to pick up on something you said when you were speaking about being influenced by Alan Thrall and Omar Asuf, etc. And it was the fact that you were getting no results. What way were you training back then in order to not get any results, so to speak? So I was following a very minimalistic routine which is part for the course, usually for people who train for strength. Not saying that it's bad for strength, but for bodybuilding, it's not the way. So I was ignoring certain key body parts. I was simply not training them because I was told, hey, this compound movement also sort of hits that part of the body, so ignore it. So triceps, for example, I would not train my triceps because I was doing bench press and overhead press. And these apparently train the tricep. Result, I have terrible triceps years down the line because I never isolated them. Then I also was doing minimal volume with very low rep ranges and very high intensity, which did help to gain strength, but for hypertrophy is simply not the way, at least not if it's your entire training. And also it caused a lot of injuries because you do a lot of reps very close to failure and very close to redlining the body and eventually the body just snaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what was the program that you moved on to when you started to get the ball rolling? Well, it wasn't necessarily a program at first. It's just that I started to eliminate movements that caused problems in the past. And I started to add things that I should have had it a long time ago or things I knew were good. So dumbbell rows, for example, I always knew dumbbell rows were great for back development. But for some reason, I say some reason, I know exactly why, because they interfered with my deadlift. I took them away because I thought, well, deadlift is more important. I realized afterwards that no, actually, deadlift is not more important than doing your back isolation. So I added dumbbell rows in, and it was really just a process of relearning what made sense. It was a process of, of moving away from the brainwashing and starting to follow proper bodybuilding logic. And the good thing is that usually it's once you understand that and once you put in the work, things that make sense start to just fall into place. Yeah, yeah. So one thing that's always interested me as well with regards to the Noble Natty community is how they try to break down convention, particularly with certain body parts, such as forearms and calves. I was always brought up to believe that these areas are totally genetic and you have no control over them whatsoever. What was it that created that environment for you guys to challenge these ideas and just kind of throw two sheets to the wind and start working on these body parts? 
and not be constricted by the, the, the mainstream information at the time? For me, I can speak for the other guys, but for me, it was personal experience because I was the guy who for a very long time believed that he had weak body parts. So, for example, I thought, oh, I have terrible lats insertion. That's why I have bad lats. The reality is that I never trained my lats. I was doing yeah. deadlifts thinking, oh, it trains the lats. It doesn't. Yeah. You need to do pull-ups, vertical pulls, horizontal pulls, all of that stuff that I wasn't doing. Then I started to do them, and lo and behold, I started to get very good lat development to the point that now I realize I have pretty good attachment for lats. It's just that I neglected for super, super long. So once you realize that, you think, okay, if that's true for lats, why wouldn't it also be true for the rest of the body? And so yeah. all of the, the dogma about like forearms and calves, things that I've heard people say, things that people still say to this day, yeah. A week ago, I stumbled upon, upon the page of one of these guys, and it made me sad because I'm thinking, okay, what is the purpose of this? You're telling people to ignore forearms and calves. Best case scenario, they do, and maybe they have good genetics and they get good calves. But most of the time, what you're doing is you're creating the scenario that you describe. Right? The guy says, oh, don't even bother with these muscle groups because they're small forever. People never train them. They stay small forever. And then they're like, oh, he was right. Well, no, he was only right because you followed what he said. He created the truth that he was saying. It's not the truth. And I also know that for a fact because I have very small wrists and I was always told you'll never have big forearms. I've started to isolate my forearms and my forearms blew up. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's so mind-boggling, actually, because it, every single muscle in the body is primed for hypertrophy if it gets worked in a certain manner. But when someone tells you otherwise, you, you tend to believe them because ultimately what it's doing is, is reducing the level of hard work involved. So you look for a coping strategy just to make sure that your workouts probably aren't going to be as demanding as they should be in order to create growth. But that that was something that always fascinated me because another one was the abs. The abs was I get, like when you spoke about abs, it really hit home with me because I was also a believer in the idea that compound movements will take care of your abs. And you were the first guy that I really cottoned onto who was promoting this. No, you need to work your abs fucking hard, like, and you need to work them all the time. And you will get like you will get that elusive six pack. What was it that pushed you in that direction with regards to abs training? Well, the good thing for me with abs was that I've always trained abs because when I started training, I was obsessed with two things: biceps and abs. <laughs> it's all I cared about: bigger biceps, bigger and and nice six pack. So what I would do is every single day I would I had like a very old. Uh, desk it was like made of food very heavy and i would stick my feet underneath i had a tiny radio on top of the desk i would play the radio and i would just do sit-ups until i couldn't and that got me to sometimes doing like 45 minutes of sit-ups where i would yeah. take small breaks and then just keep going until i couldn't and that got me crazy results and i remember i tried a, a commercial gym with a friend of mine we both played football and so we wanted to do like a lifting session together and he was stronger than me on everything Except abs. When we when it finally got time to do abs, he was done in five minutes and I, I just kept going. And I remember him telling me, hey, why are you doing this? I told him, well, because I can, right? My abs have the endurance. And he was apparently also a follower in bro science back then because he told me, oh, there's no point in training your abs that long. My coach says that after five minutes, it's done. It's nothing happens anymore. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Ten, 10 years later, he has a gut and I have a six pack. So who was right? <laughs> <laughs> one of the videos you made was speaking about getting that stretch with your abs like when most people do crunches they don't get a stretch at all or uh, even conventional sit-ups how did you stumble upon that idea well it's also something that people always said for other muscle groups right so if you want bigger biceps you have to stretch the biceps if you want bigger traps you have to stretch the traps but for some reason magically for the abs it didn't work right for some reason it didn't transfer to abs so for abs isometric contraction was all you needed just brace and magically you will have a six pack well no it's just like any muscle it responds very well to being stretched and having to contract to get the momentum going and to get your positive back so to me it was just logic i tried to approach bodybuilding as a game of logic if something makes sense for a muscle why wouldn't it make sense for another 
Yeah, yeah, it was a bit of a game changer for me. And it's quite sad that I'm only discovering all this in my 40s. When I mean, I've been training for 25 odd years, it's actually quite embarrassing. So what was what was the first programme you designed yourself when you thought, I'm actually got a bit of a talent for this? Wow, that is a good question. Something tells me I should remember this. You know, like your first paycheck, your, the first programme you make. But I don't actually... I'm certain that if you like go back on my channel and you click like old videos, you'll find technically the first program. It might have been like a full body split or like a, like a body part split. I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you start getting results from people doing these programs? Were they emailing you and like sending you progress pictures? Yep, which is one of the most gratifying part, right? Because it's nice to see that when people apply your advice, they get better. Now, the thing not to do, and it's a pitfall that many YouTubers fall into, is to think that they got the results because of you, right? That's not true. They got the results because of their hard work. And I hope that more people start to realize that because I see people say, oh, I got my gains thanks to you. Well, I'm not the one who went to the gym and did the, did the exercises, right? Yeah. You put in all of the work. I just gave you sort of like a route and path to follow. And the funny thing too is that I have many people who reach out to me who have much better genetics than I have, and I can tell that they're going to get much bigger than than me in a few years if they just keep going. So it's yeah. it's a privilege for me to be able to also guide them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what kind of splits do you try and keep away from? Because I know you're big on the gentleman split, and it took me a while to actually cotton on to the name gentleman split. When I heard it for the first time, I was like, what the fuck does that even mean? But then I realized that it's like a step above a bro split. You get the bro and you get the gentleman. So that, that one took me a, quite a while to cotton on to. So I know you're quite big on gentleman splits. What splits do you kind of think are probably not so productive? So I think that pretty much every template can work if you program it properly. So body part splits work. Full body works. Upper lower works. Push pull leg works. The only one where I tell people to just not do it is bro splits because the very idea of the bro split and the way you're supposed to run it is counterproductive in itself. Like a push pull leg, okay, push pull leg, you can make it work. You can always make it work. But the bro split dictates you're going to train one body part one time a week. And that's already bad because it's a restriction that ha that makes no sense. Why would you restrict yourself to that? It's completely idiotic. And then you fall into the uh, habit also of trying to hit and destroy the muscle as much as possible. So you'll do triceps and you'll do maybe five exercises for triceps. And that also is stupid because there's no point. Like half of the work you're going to do on that day is going to be junk volume because the muscle is not going to be able to produce any strength or power. So you're literally just wasting your time. And I still, I don't, actually I do understand why is because they're being contrarians, but some people still like to defend bro splits. Oftentimes it's because they don't actually run bro splits. They run body part splits, which is a yeah. good split, yeah. and they confuse the two. Yeah. And sometimes it's also because they don't understand the importance of frequency. Frequency is being disrespected. Volume and intensity are the kings. And frequency is like the little brother that doesn't know how to play soccer and so he stays at home and he like reads books or whatever. But the issue yeah. is that that's not true because without frequency, your volume and intensity is for nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I always look to things like gymnasts who perform the same movements day in and day out. I've always considered gymnasts to be at the top of the tree, aesthetic-wise, when you look at their shoulders and their lats, and they are training those body parts on a daily basis. So frequency always made sense to me in that respect. But I think the problem with fitness nowadays is that everybody's trying to carve a niche, and they're also trying to cause drama with things that don't really matter which means that they can get their names out there at the extent where they are pushing out dodgy information in some respects but when you talk about a bro split do you talk about like a, a chest day a legs day an arms day whereas a body part split is more chest uh, shoulders and triceps Absolutely, yeah. It's the difference between something that is synergistic and something that is not, because to have a synergy, you need to have two elements. So a good body part split right off the like the top of my head. Monday, you do chest, shoulders, triceps. 
Then Tuesday, you could do arm swings, glutes, and maybe some lats. And then Wednesday, you could come in, you could do maybe abs, and you could do some forearm work, and you could also insist a bit more on shoulder via isolation. All of this works seamlessly because it's very easy to program. You know exactly what you hit on which day because the frequency makes sense. This is something that I promote because the gentleman split is a mix of an upper lower and a body part split. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So do you think that one of the key tenets of a good program is some simplicity? Yes, yes. And the more advanced I become, the more I realize that simpli simplicity and flexibility are the two keys to a good program. The most important thing, of course, being how much you like it. So it's adherence. I can make you the best program in the world. If you don't like the exercises or it's too much volume for you, it's not the best program in the world because you're not going to like it. And this is when we get into the discussion of programming for the self, because I can make good programs, but the person who can make the program even better is you. It's your ability to actually yeah. read it and then like modify it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm lately I've started to come around to the idea that I think a program ultimately should be a framework as opposed to a program where you have to do a designated exercise for so many reps. Because once, like, to go on a tangent, you've got a home gym which allows you to train in a certain fashion with a lot of supersets and giant sets, whereas a lot of guys who are using a commercial gym will not have the ability to do these programs because gyms are just fucking heaving with people nowadays and the ability to move from a machine to something else. So how do you how do how do you circumvent that when you're creating a program? I always try to pair exercises that would be easy to superset even in a commercial gym. It's not always possible, but when I can I try. And now I actually I'm going back to a commercial gym. I have a membership. And so I'm applying what I preach, right? Because I have people all the time who tell me, hey, this is not realistic. Well, I have my own program. I run supersets and I go to the commercial gym and it's not an issue. I can yeah. run these things, right? I can take a cable thing and I can have like a machine at the other side of the gym. Do I sometimes come back to the cable to see that someone took it? Yeah, but it's not the end of the day. It's not the end of the world. I can just wait and then I, I walk in with the guy, right? So... It really comes down to how ballsy you are in a commercial gym because you can get away with a lot. You can be yeah. an asshole. Like some people are just like they just yeah. take equipment and they create like a almost like a base camp around the bench <laughs> and like that's it. That's theirs. I don't do that, but understand that you pay the membership and if someone wants to take the equipment that you're using for your superset, they are adults. They can ask. If they don't have the balls to ask, well, it's yours. I know this personally because I've worked in gyms for the last 20 years and I have seen it all. I've seen it all. And I had an incident where a guy would come in and you know those boxing bros that come into gyms? They always gravitate towards the heavy bag and they'll get the silver dumbbells and shadow box. Yeah. <laughs> this guy had commandeered a section of the gym and he, like you'd stated, created a base camp, like an alpha base camp. And he had mats and fucking all sorts of implements. And it annoyed me to a certain degree. I thought, no, like supersets, giant sets, whatever. But this guy was taking a liberty. And I walked up to the gentleman and I says, listen, mate, you, you cannot use all that amount of equipment. And he got right in my fucking face has no point in their minds and he said like in a really Glaswegian gruff accent I don't train like the fucking pussies in here and I was like holy shit this guy is an absolute fucking maniac <laughs> yeah. so you're right like you can get away with so much behaviour and what he also like reminded me of was I've seen bodybuilders who have developed new neurosis or neurotic behaviour through the structure of their programme Meaning that if they don't have access to a cable machine at the start of their workout, they will go absolutely fucking ape shit. Have you ever had any of the moments, NH? Well, I have quite the neurotic disposition myself, and it has led to some interesting developments in my life. Like, for example, I broke my ribs a long time ago, and then I went on a trip with my wife to Chicago, and I just couldn't not train. So I had to find a gym. I had to travel two hours in a city I knew nothing about where I should have just spent my time 
visiting with my wife. Instead, I was busy just breaking my ribs even more, doing front squats in a random gym, bleeding all over our equipment. I, I feel sorry for these people. I, I used to have like those, those uh, completely fucked up shins from deadlifts because I didn't deadlift <laughs> properly. I would bleed on their platform, on their barbell. And in my head, I thought, I'm so, I'm so hardcore. I'm so badass. Everyone else in that gym was looking at me like, what a jackass. <laughs> what a fucking idiot this person is. And yeah, I was. And this is why a big thing that I'm working on as a man is flexibility. Is to not yeah. like have an aneurysm because things don't go exactly how you planned, right? So now, if I come into the gym and the thing that I want is taken, hey, it's fine. I have a replacement exercise. I can do something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How are you finding that transition from the home gym? In fact, let's go back. When did you make the first transition from commercial gym to home gym? Perfect timing. It was in 2020. So right before everything shut down, I bought all of my equipment before the prices shut up. I built a home gym in a garage and then boom, the entire world was busy <laughs> staying home and playing dead. And I was in my home gym loving my life. So that was the transition. And the retransition back into the commercial gym was not even three weeks ago because yeah. now I train in a basement. Yeah, so yeah. everything, and I'm six feet, and the basement is seven feet. So if I lift my arm, I touch the ceiling. So no overhead press, no pull-ups. I was like, all right, let's just get a commercial gym, and I can do all of these exercises in the gym. And I'm loving it. Yeah, yeah. What was the initial transition? Why did that come about? Because I moved in the middle of bumfuck nowhere, and the closest gym was 25 minutes. They had one squat rack one squat rack they had maybe like five or six dumbbells and i realized if i go there i will be the guy that camps in the squat rack and no one can use it and it will not go well right i know there's going to be some trouble so might as well just build my home gym <laughs> so how are you finding the, the the transition back to the commercial gym having trained in a home gym for the last couple of years I feel like a bear that has been in hibernation for decades and is finally coming out and meeting humans yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not social at all. I don't yeah. talk to people. People don't talk to me. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wear a certain getup when I'm at the gym that makes me very unapproachable because I look like a complete loon. Right, so, so I have what's the, what's the get up? I have very short shorts, <laughs> way too short of shorts, where it's like almost indecent. I always wore the same white teal with like holes in them. I have a fanny pack with cats on it. So I think people look at me and think, all right, he is either deranged or very eccentric. We, we must just leave this person alone, which is the expected result, right? I want people to leave me alone so, I, so that I can train in peace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That actually sounds like normal gym attire, to be honest with you, from what I see nowadays. What have you noticed differently about gym culture now? Well, the gym I go to is a hardcore gym. Yeah. So... What I was expecting was not what I got. I was expecting a lot of young people on their phones, of just complete lack of focus. It's not what I it's not what I got. Thankfully, I'm very glad for that. And also, people. I mean, I still see many mistakes. The one thing I've noticed actually is that people misuse machines. So machines are supposed to be created because they allow you to use less weight and get better results, less overall fatigue for the joints, etc. The amount of people I see who stack as many plates as they can and then do that much range of motion on the machine with like body and glitch out the wazoo. And I'm looking at them like, what do you think is going to happen? Do you think you're going to get any results from this? It's like a, a perpetual ego lifting competition, expect, except that there's no one to impress because no yeah. one cares how much plates you can use on the machine. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it's also something that I'm starting to see more and more on Instagram. People who say machines are better than free weights, but the reason for that is because they can use more weight. Yeah. So I, to me, that doesn't quite match. I agree that machines are good, but not for that reason. Yeah, I think a lot of people are using the fact that they, it creates stability now as well. That seems to be a buzzword I see quite a lot. So are you ever intending to film your workouts in this commercial gym and put them on YouTube? The first off, I think that cameras are not allowed in that gym, but I, I'm sure I could work something around that. But the issue is that the gym is easily recognizable. I mean, that yeah. if you live in that city and you see the inside of the gym, you will know where I live. So eh, I'm not, I'm not too <laughs> keen on sense. that. 
It makes sense. And it's quite weird the fact that they don't allow filming in a gym because <clears throat> gyms seem to resemble a fucking universal film studio nowadays. Like you're literally stepping over tripods and you're trying not to get in people's videos. And I find the gym quite a stressful experience nowadays. I think it's like everything else. If you care, it will be stressful. And if you decide to not care, it will not be. So for me, if you set your tripod and it's on my path, I'm walking straight through it because it's yeah. not your gym, right? So you yeah. don't get to do that. Yeah. If, yeah, you know, like, I mean, and maybe it's because you're nicer than I am. <laughs> well, this I'm might be the reason. Nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a weakness, sadly. <laughs> but yeah. That, that, that's quite interesting because, like, what happens if you actually turn up on an Instagram reel or a TikTok video one day wearing your uh, spectacular French gym wear and then you can potentially reveal your location? How, do, how would that one work out? Well, if it happens, it happens. I mean, I knew going to the gym that it might be so that one day a guy comes up to me and says, oh, are you natural hypertrophy? And if that happens, I'm not going to be like, no. No, yeah, I'm Ru yeah. I'm Russian. My name is uh, my name is not natural hypertrophy. I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, the second I open my mouth, they're going to realize that I'm who I am. So if that happens, that happens. I'm not too worried about it. Also because I still live in the sticks. I still live in the forest. The gym where I train is in a city that's like very far, but it's still technically where I live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How how do you cope with the commute to the gym? I listen to classical music. <laughs> that's it. See, that's the thing. Scotland is such a small country that everything is on your doorstep. Whereas when you go to a, like where you stay, you have to travel long distances to get anywhere. And mm. that that would fucking kill me. I don't think my head could cope with that. Well, I'm lucky that I don't have to travel for work. So the yeah. only time I take the car is to go grocery shopping or to go to the gym, which are joyous, it's joyous occurrences. So I'm not stressed out. Like Even if there's traffic... I just have Chopin blaring in my ears and I'm just happy in the car waiting. So one thing that I really wanted to touch upon was the recent video you made speaking about your bulking nightmare, which it was a hilarious video because you, you told it in that, that NH style, but it was the thumbnail that really sent me over the edge. Like I, I, I respect the fact you had the balls to put that up, particularly the one where, like, because you looked like you had put on a bit of beef, but not the, the kind of beef that you were looking to put on, and you looked like you were almost looking at the bottom part of a spoon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Could you go give us a brief rundown of that Balkan nightmare? So. <laughs> Man, I mean, of course the video is going to do it more justice, but essentially what happened to me was that for some reason at some point, and it's when I discovered commercial gyms and compound movements, I realized that the easy way to get strong was just to get bigger. So I started to stuff my face and I did things that looking back, I'm like, why didn't anyone intervene? So I would go to Subway twice a day and get two like foot long subs every single time to the point that the people who worked at Subway ended up knowing who I was and they knew exactly what I would order because I would get the meatballs all the time. They would like give me free soup. <laughs> they gave me a, a card that was only for employees to get me a discount because I was sp I was spending so much money at Subway. And I'm looking back, I'm like, why? It was so expensive too. Yeah, yeah. So one thing you touched upon in the video was the fact that you never counted calories during your bulk. You just went for the get uh, big, get big, rich piano style mantra. Is that still a methodology you follow to this day? Yes. Yes, because... Is there, any, is there any particular reason for that? Yeah, because, again, I have a very neurotic nature and I'm a control freak. So okay. anything that I can... Anything I can ease on in regards to that and numbers, I do. And I know for a fact that if I start to count macros, count calories, it's going to consume me entirely. I'm going to be obsessed with it. So... I guesstimate. I look at the scale, I look at my body, I look at my performance, and based on that, I know what I must eat, what I must not eat, if I need to eat more. Do I sometimes fuck up and lose weight? Yeah, like just recently in summer, I was spending time with my family in the mountains, stuffing my face, I come back home, I weight myself, I had lost eight pounds. Yeah, I must have been walking in those mountains. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah lots of walking, <laughs> lots of hiking. 
but it, this is just it's how it is. There's no reason to freak out. If I lost the pounds, I can gain it back. It's wider weight. It's no big deal. But it's the approach that works for me. But does France not have quite a low rate of obesity? For now, for now, we're slowly catching up to the US because we everything that the USA does, we do 10 years later. So I'm fully expecting that we're going to end up just as fat as they are. But uh, yeah, because there's a lot of physical activity, people walk a lot, people bike a lot, and also the type of food that we eat, it's not as fatty. We don't have a snack culture. We don't have a soda culture. People drink water or coffee or tea. So yeah, it's it's in the environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One thing that always stood out to me as well was you do not promote a protein-heavy diet, I believe. You kind of buck the trend in that respect. How did you come about that way of thinking? Because that is dogma to a certain degree. So I have used to be the guy who was obsessed with proteins to the point where if I missed a single protein shake in the day, they ruined. <laughs> like I would, I would think, oh, all I did in the gym was for nothing because I didn't get that 20 grams of protein. So good job, right? You wasted a day. Of course, horrible toxic mindset and also not true at all. And eventually I realized that because I stopped drinking so much whey protein just out of desperation because I was tired of it. And I never replaced it with anything. So my protein started to go lower and lower and lower. And I thought to myself, well, one of two things happen. Either the prophecy is realized and what everyone on YouTube says is going to happen. I'm going to become a UNICEF kid and I'm going to lose all of my gains. <laughs> Or nothing is going to happen and I'll keep progressing. And unsurprisingly, the second option happened. I kept progressing. Nothing happened. <coughs> Even though I cut my proteins in half. So I realized that, hey, like that 80 grams of protein you stuffed your face with, yeah, you just pissed it right off like your body. It was right into the toilet bowl. It did nothing. <laughs> do, do you know how much protein you consume, consume on a daily basis? I would say between 70 and 100 grams. That's really low in bodybuilding terms. Yeah, super low. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something that I've started to like think. I had a guest on last night who said the very same thing. He just eats chickpeas all the time. And he's hitting about 70 grams of protein. And the guy's incredibly ripped. Incredibly ripped. But I think protein is definitely overstated. But it's refreshing to see people say that nowadays because protein's an industry now. Like every morsel of food that you'll buy in a supermarket now has that marketing gimmick of the company placing protein, like protein eggs, protein milk. It's like you can't escape fucking protein now. They've, they've basically marketed a macronutrient. Yeah. Right, so one thing I want to touch on before we go as well is your, your promotion of calisthenics because my channel is primarily, primarily calisthenics-based. What is it about calisthenics that you find such a powerful tool to include in your inventory, so to speak? So first, I think that it's an excellent way for novices to get used to training the body because it feels very natural to move the body. And it's usually patterns that are very easy to learn, at least for the non-advanced skills, and very easy to recover from so you can do them more frequently and get more adapted to the movement. Mm -hmm. Then some people stop there. Some people say, oh, calisthenics are for novices. I don't think that's true at all. I think calisthenics is for everyone. The issue is that the more you progress, the more in love with compound movements you're going to become and the more you're going to turn your back on body weight movements. And I think that's a mistake because something like a push-up, for example, doesn't have to be accessory to a bench press. It can become your main builder. Actually, many people would be better suited to doing just weighted push-ups yeah than yeah. just doing bench press or even weighted dips. Yeah. And once you realize that, it opens a whole new path because I think that almost every single muscle of the upper body can be trained optimally via calisthenics. There are yeah. a few areas like the traps, maybe the forearms, the long head of the tricep where doing cables, machines or free weights might be better. And the legs is of course always going to be better with these implements because calisthenics is a bit lacking. But yeah implementing all of that with via weighted calisthenics i think for bodybuilding is the way to go yeah so do you think that weighted calisthenics is an integral part of a successful program yes every single one of my programs at least has one weighted calisthenics movement yeah i, I think the push-up is a lost art nowadays like and it, it's quite a shame because i get a lot of guys who come into the gym and they cannot do a push-up and they always have like it's like cycling a bike 
when you cycle a bike as an adult, you have a childhood memory of the bike. So you think, I'm just going to jump on a, a, a bike and cycle up a hill. But then you start cycling up the hill and you are blowing out of every single hole in your body. But that never happened as a kid. As a kid, you could cycle all day till the cows came home. But as an adult, it's it's a red pill moment. And it's the same with push-ups. I'll get guys who will come into the gym and I always ask them, can you do a push-up? And they will always say, oh, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah, I, I used to be able, I could do 100 push-ups. And then you'll see them start the push-up movement and they'll just fall flat in their face. They don't even have the strength to get back up. But yeah, it's a movement that no one really takes seriously anymore. Because it's one of the most profound exercises that a man will ever do in his life because it's something that we grow up with. And that's a shame. But I respect the fact that you bring the push-ups because I remember you making a video where it was, I think a lot of you noble natty guys made a 10 best exercise. And I think, I don't know what your number one was. It might have been push-ups. It was push-ups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That blew my mind. And it kind of galvanized me because it made me, it kind of gave me that extra bit of belief in what I was doing. Okay, so before we wrap up, I've also got another question for you. And it's just to like riff on something that you have said in a couple of videos where you speak about the essence of natural bodybuilding, how it's about health and longevity. But one thing I've always felt that the, the noble natty community... Natty Oh, you muted yourself. That's my dog. My dog's trying to jump up and click me. One thing that I think that the Noble Natty community uh, kind of skims over or doesn't even touch upon is the conditioning aspect of building a body. Not natural bodybuilding, but building that body. Is that something that you're going to pursue at some point in your life, or are you just strictly hypertrophy? So... I've always done a lot of cardiovascular endurance exercises because I used to train for basketball and for football. And so my training was 80% that, where I would, I would sprint up a hill, I would do plyometrics, all things to make sure that on the field I would never get tired because stamina was the most important thing for me, not power, nor speed, but stamina. But I also feel like I burnt myself out doing that because I have a long history of swimming, of running. And so when I discovered lifting, I was like, wow, this is so different. But I can still feel that I have some love in my heart for these things. So surely one day, especially maybe if I get like in my 40s, 50s, and you know, the mass game is not as easy anymore, maybe I might go back to my roots and start swimming. So for yeah. example, something that I'm very interested in is open water swimming. Yeah. When you cross channels, when you swim from island to island, I can see myself doing that eventually. And if that happens, conditioning is going to become my number one priority again. Yeah, yeah. Tr training is always a journey. We always take a different path at some points. We never stick to the one path because there's always a path over the other mountain that looks a lot more scenic. But NH, that was an absolute pleasure. I really enjoyed that. Y you make me laugh. I'm not going to lie. It's that Gallic humour. Anyway, thanks for coming on. It was a great honour and all the best to you, buddy. Thank you for having me.